Hey all, it's Evan Hill here of Real Hawk Talk. Super excited to talk to you about our good friends over at Burger Master. If you know anything about me, I crave burgers in my sleep. I do not mess around. Started in 1952, Burger Master is the best burger chain in Washington State. They have locations all over the Puget Sound in Aurora, Bellevue, Everett, Mill Creek University, and Mount Vernon. Their fresh ingredients and classic driving experience make them the greatest burger chain in the state of Washington. Stop by Burger Master on your way home from a Seahawks game. You won't regret it. Hey everybody, it's Brian. If you haven't noticed, it is absolutely nuts out there in the housing market. If you don't know exactly what you're doing and you don't have someone that you trust by your side to guide you through the process, good luck getting the home you want or getting the best price for the home you're selling. John Hurlbut at Altitude Homes is a guy I've known for years, over a decade, a friend and someone I trust implicitly. If you are in Pierce, South King, or Thurston counties, there is nobody better to help guide you through the real estate process right now. Go on over to altitudehomesteam.com slash hawkablogger. Now, again, that's altitudehomesteam.com slash hawkblogger. Sign up to contact John. He will help you with the process, and all referrals will result in a $1,000 donation from John and the Altitude Homes team to Ben's Fund. Everybody wins. Go in there, get your help, get your dream home, get the most money for your home. Altitudehomesteam.com slash hawkblogger. Hey all, Evan Hill here of Real Hawk Talk. Super excited to talk to you guys about our good friend Blake Johnson of ManifestFit.com. Football season is quickly approaching and it is a struggle to stay in shape while eating burgers and nachos. ManifestFit.com is your one only true online personal training service with workout and nutrition programs specifically based on your needs. They work with clients all over the U.S. and what makes Blake and ManifestFit.com so unique is that they don't believe training should be a luxury item. Now's the time to start. Head over to ManifestFit.com, click on how to join and fill out the form. Their team will get back to you ASAP and help you start building a healthier, happier, louder Seahawks family. The skyline is etched in my veins. You can never put that out no matter how hard it rains. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 179th episode. Yes, the 179th episode of Real Hawk Talk. I am Brian Nimhauser at Hawk Blogger on Twitter, and we have a really fun show tonight. Not only do we have tons of great things to talk about. But we have, you know, this this is either going to be very exciting for some of you or very disappointing, depending on what kind of show you like. We have the rational crew today. There's going to be adult conversation, and I don't mean inappropriate adult conversation. I mean like mature, not imi- not not that inappropriate, mature, normal conversations between sane adults about your Seahawks, about lots of stuff going on in the NFL. And let's face it, we got a big game this week. I mean. I think we all maybe were, I don't know, concerned about what this game might look like a few weeks ago. We'll see what you guys feel, but I think the folks are kind of like cautiously looking forward to how this game plays out for a lot of different reasons. Um, So part of our rational crew, um, let me bring in Dana O'Gorman at Dana OG on Twitter. Dana, I feel like it's been ages like how are you doing oh good I know it was just a week if you can believe that we were here last week and we were talking about you know the ridiculousness of everything that went on last week but you know it's just I'm not sure what happened in week nine week nine was insane and I'm really glad it was a Seahawks bye week because none of the games this week made any sense it was just crazy (laughs) yeah yeah, we'll talk about that thank god we were out of it (laughs) I, I don't know why I don't know why the bye week felt like seven years ago. I, 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 I honestly don't, but it really feels like there's been a long break, um, but, but maybe it's just me. Um, so that's Dana. Uh, always happy to have Dana as our, as all our listeners. Dana is probably our most popular uh, person on the show who has the least amount of detractors. Her like, you know, they have the thumbs up on your shows and the thumbs down. Her like thumbs up to thumbs down is a super high ratio. <laughs> In the running for similar high ratio, thumbs up to thumbs down, is our next host, uh, Jeff Simmons, at Real Jeff Simmons. You know, being Canadian, you know, y- you don't offend people much. People like you, Jeff. They they constantly are wanting your points of view. Even my own mother is like, where was Jeff? Where was Jeff on the show? So uh, good to see you, dude. How are you doing? 
I'm I'm good, man. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of I feel what you're saying. It, it feels like the Seahawks have been off for a month. And yeah. it's been kind of nice in a way. Uh, sort of what Dana said. Last week was nuts. I think it was one of the strangest NFL weeks. And it was nice to just sit back and watch it. So it's kind of re- kind of refreshed me a little bit. We were all kind of in the dumps where the season was going. And it kind of feels like we have a second life here. So I'm kind of reinvigorated. I, I feel that maybe this was more a bye week for us than it was for the team. Like maybe we just needed a little break and, and maybe that the fact that there hasn't really felt like there was much on the line. I mean, Jacksonville almost qualified as another bye week. Like it's almost been like two weeks since there's been real football and uh, or three weeks, depending on your perspective. So uh, in any event, in the meantime, as you said, Jeff, like fill people in. If you could have like gone through every single team in the NFC that you needed to lose, if you want the Seahawks to to grab one of these playoff spots, I think they pretty much all lost this weekend, right? Like, so if you remember at the end of our last show, I kind of slipped this in there, and I think all of you disagreed with me. And I said one of the things I was kind of optimistic about going into the bye week was I thought the middle of the NFC was really really looking bad i think the vikings just lost daniel hunter sam darnold was on the verge of being benched and i slipped in there if you're still a believer in this team there's a path to the playoffs and everyone just sort of shot me down the thing that really surprised me is what i expected carolina to get worse darnold's now at four to six weeks so they're out i don't know if they'll win another two games carolina um they were three and oh the team that i thought kind of had the clear path ahead of Seattle was San Francisco. San Francisco had guys coming back last week and they were going up against Kyler, no Kyler, no Hopkins, Arizona. I thought, okay. No AJ Green. No AJ Green. I think, okay, San Francisco gets George Kittle back. Brandon Ayuk's looking a little better. But they had one of the worst losses a team could have. And there's just a lot of questions going on with that team right now. The 49ers' first three draft picks this year have all been healthy scratches the last couple of games. So there's a lot of – we complain about the Seahawks. There's a lot of weird things going on. So you combine that with Carolina and Philadelphia, the Seahawks are one game out of the playoffs. I know we want this team to be a Super Bowl team, and that's probably not in the cards. They're not a contender. They don't look like it. We got to see the Rams fall on their face. We got to see the Packers lose it was kind of a reinvigorating week because the Seahawks now we're going to talk about this, but they have a lot of people suddenly coming back and with the rest of the conference sort of falling apart, even at three and five, I think their playoff odds went up like 12% and they didn't play this week. So yeah, there is a path. They're one game out of the playoffs as bad as the season has been. That's weird, but it's, well, it's weird that the Dana, this whole, rule change from whenever it was about getting to seven playoff teams. It feels like the entire NFC basically makes the playoffs uh, at some point. I mean, six felt like a lot when you had two wild card teams beyond the division winners, right? So now it's up to seven and, you know, we haven't really talked about those spots as much because the Seahawks haven't been just scraping their way into the playoffs most years. They won the division last year. Right. And even teams like, Chicago losing to Pittsburgh was good for Seattle. Like there's (laughs) like these teams that are just crappy. Uh, And then the saints, you know, who would come in here and won with Jameis Winston and not by a lot, but they managed to pull out a win. They lose Jameis Winston for, for what looks like the year. And they've got, you know, it's Trevor Simeon or, or or whomever quarterbacking for them and they beat the bucks, but then they kind of come back to, reality this past week and lose to what the Falcons right Mm -hmm. um and the Falcons are one of the teams that we're battling where you're like oh do we want the Falcons at this point it feels like the Saints could they're right now in the sixth playoff spot I don't think anybody should be betting on the Saints you know having a strong finish to the season so you probably are talking about two playoff spots that could end up being up for grabs all you need is for the Seahawks to actually get an offense to join the defense and for the defense to prove that they can sustain against much better competition. It's no small feat. So, so yeah, I mean, how are you feeling coming out of the, the weekend and all the results? 
You know, it was really fun, kind of like Jeff said, to just sit back and watch it happen because we could do that. We could just watch it kind of unfold in front of us. And, and what was really interesting to me, not only the AFC was fascinating to me this week because I mean, the Bills lost to the Jags, for God's sake. There wasn't a touchdown in that game. And there was like all these weird things going on. And it seems like the waters are really muddied in the AFC, that there really isn't a top dog. But then you turn and you get to the NFC and you have three solid teams. Arizona's the only one that didn't lose of those solid teams at the top last week because the Rams lost. Green Bay lost. Tampa Bay didn't play, obviously. but um, And so it's really muddied after that. And so it does give you hope because, yes, we don't really think this is a, 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 a Super Bowl-level team. But if they can turn this season around and make the playoffs, it, it shows – it, it shows, oh, I hate to say the word fight because that's not really what I'm thinking, but it just shows that they, they were always in it. They never just gave up. Like you've seen a lot of teams, they just look like they've given up and Seattle hasn't done that. And that should be exciting, especially with the additions of Russell Wilson, D. Eskrid, you know, maybe Chris Carson coming back this week. Ooh, it could get real fun real quick, but still without the massive pressure of you have to win a Super Bowl because we know that that's probably not this team this year. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't think any of us feel like it's a foregone conclusion the Seahawks will make the playoffs. The Seahawks are still three and five, and they're about to play two, you know, seven win teams back to back. You know, <laughs> this could be a one week kind of fun point for us, but I don't know. I think we'll get we'll get on it toward the end when we do predictions. I don't think it's insane to think the Seahawks. Um, could win this weekend in Green Bay. A few weeks ago, I would have thought that that was really silly to even talk about, but I don't think it's out of the question. And, and I think we'll get into this in more detail, but I don't think the Packers are as good as their record indicates. Um, when I dug into them and did my tail of the tape this morning um, over at hot, hot uh their, their offense is not great. Even when it Rogers was around, it's not what we th- have thought it to be it's really their defense that's been great so far this season (laughs) ironically that's kind of the truth about the Seahawks so far um I think we talked about it a little bit I know you guys mostly disagreed with me back in the day when the season was starting that I was really frustrated with the offense and I think uh everyone most everyone else was frustrated with the defense but you look at it now the Seahawks defense is ranked eighth in the NFL in points allowed and since week Four. That includes the San Francisco game, San Francisco and the Rams game, right? Uh, they're fourth in the NFL in points allowed. Fourth, right? And so, and, and they've been doing this all with an offense that has run some of the fewest amount of plays. I think it might be the fewest amount of plays per game in the NFL. So the defense is doing all this and they're one of the top third down defenses. They're faced one of the largest number of plays per game of any team in the defense in the NFL. So Jeff, when I look at that, I'm like, yes, it matters. Yes. We need to see how they do against better competition. All that's absolutely true, but I feel like this defense has been really holding things together um, more than I think we've given them credit for, for, you know, over a month um, for sure. Yeah, and I thought the Saints game was especially a strong performance that almost got overlooked because of how bad Geno Smith was in that game. And really, uh, yeah, like you said, uh, you start to see some of these teams and holding a team to 10 points, that like the Saints who scored 30 on the Bucks the next week, was pretty impressive. But I think there are some changes that happen that we need to recognize. And obviously, yeah, these next two games are huge measuring sticks for them or else there'll always be that similar narrative to last year where they only play well against bad quarterbacks. But two things changed, and I think it may matter. Um, number one, I think Trey, Fla- Trey Brown coming in and Trey Flowers coming out and DJ Reed moving over has changed the cornerback situation. If you watch this team in the first three games or even the first four games, everyone was talking about the corners of this team. And you still see it. You still see the narrative going on around Seahawks Twitter that we have horrible corners that hasn't been the case really since week three. 
So Sidney Jones has played better too, Brian. You've been pushing that. So since Trey Brown's come in, Trey Brown's probably their best corner, and he's been pretty effective. So uh, that has been a big change because if you watch that Vikings game where just guys are wide, wide open, and that Rams game where they're running the same formation, it seems like their coverage has gone a lot better. Quandre Diggs has played better as a result. That's a big change. And number two, I know Carlos Dunlap's taking some heat, and I thought, Brian, you made a great point. He had a foot or a toe injury. And Dana was shouting him out too in that first in that Saints game. In that Jaguars game, he had by far his most impactful game. And you saw the guy we saw last year that just impacts the game differently. And when you watch, like, say the Titans play against the Rams this week, you see what a game record can do on defense. Now, the Seahawks don't necessarily have a game record on their D-line. Wait, a game record named who? Who? Jeffrey Simmons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you saw. I him. can't believe you missed that chance to give yourself a <laughs> shout out. I mean, you yeah, had a fantastic a game against a division rival. We were all they excited for you, dude. They have a couple, but Seahawks have a lot of depth there, but they don't necessarily have that game record. But Carlos Dunlap, his size, and when he can get that first step going, it makes a big difference. So I think those have been two big differences because guys like Puna and Al Woods have had a quietly really good season. Bobby's doing his thing and Quandre's starting to get a little better, but the coverage combined with a little bit better pass rush and Brian talked about the pressures in the Jacksonville game. I think those are things that regardless of quarterback have gotten better. And I think you've seen how much just tighter they are defensively. And that's why these two games are such a really interesting measuring stick for them. Can I add to, it was funny this week is all the OBJ stuff, which I know we're going to talk about here in a little bit, was going around. The naysayers on Odell Beckham Jr. were all like, he doesn't play defense. We need help on defense. Our offense is fine. We have DK and Tyler. We don't need help on offense. We need defense, defense. And I'm like, no, that's a narrative that you stuck with after the first couple of games. You haven't been paying attention. And and so I, I find that interesting that Seahawks fans are still kind of catching up to the fact that the defense has actually played really well instead of being stuck in the narrative that they're just horrible and that's what's wrong with the team. I think that's really well said. In fact, I'm looking for a series of stats I had pulled out on this, but um, I'll see if I can find it later. But the Seahawks offense is near the bottom of the NFL in number of three and out drives. They're near the bottom of the NFL in plays per game. They're near the bottom of the NFL in drives that have 10 or more plays. Uh, on and on and on, right? And they're, they're, they haven't been great on third downs. So, and this is not, yes, Geno Smith was awful. And still, he played one of the Seahawks' best offensive games. Like the game against Jacksonville, say what you want about the Jaguars defense. Bill certainly had challenges. Um, Josh Allen on the Jaguars certainly was a game wrecker there. Um, but in any event, the point being that this Seahawks offense, and I think maybe this points the finger a little bit at Shane Waldron, just hasn't been able to sustain drives and has been leaving their defense out to dry. Even when they've been succeeding, for most of the time, it's been boom or bust. You know, think about that Titans game, how many like one play, two play, three play drives there were because there was a big explosive touchdown, which is awesome. But then when they couldn't get those, there wasn't something to sustain. And so, you know, that's the question. And that's where I think the Eskridge for me comes back, guys, that I'm curious about what he can mean, because we don't know what we have in the Eskridge. I think we're all interested and intrigued and looking forward to seeing him play. Even the few plays he played against the Colts were intriguing. Um, can, can, you know, is it realistic? Is it reasonable to think that D. Eskridge can be part of how this offense gets a little bit more repeatable, a little bit more reliable, it, it, is, it, you know, or just scores more points, whatever the case may be. I mean, Jeff or Dana, Jeff, why don't we start with you? Yeah, it's true. We really don't know much about him. All we've seen really are those end reps and the explosion he can do, but we don't really know about him as just like a receiver. So I think having another weapon in the offense certainly will help. But to me, I'm more interested in seeing if what we saw in the last game carries over in terms of just offensive game plan and structure. In the last game, I don't know if this is a specific Jacksonville thing. 
almost for the first time all year, they ran their offense through DK and Tyler. And it wasn't just like deep shots and run the ball into butted heads. They seemed to, something changed in their philosophy. I don't know if it was Waldron getting more rope. I don't know. Cause Jay keeps has been kind of pushing that angle that this isn't a lot of Shane Waldron stuff going on. There's some like chaos behind the scenes. So in that Jacksonville game, you saw what I think is more repeatable. They got the ball to their two best players. They weren't running there into like as many loaded boxes like they were in that Saints game. And you saw just a more consistent offense that set things up for the rest of what the players can do. So Russell's coming back now. I don't know how the finger will affect his timing. I don't know how the play calling will be. He's been out for a while now. But to me, that is the more interesting thing. Are they going to run their offense through them or is it going to be the run the ball, deep shots, rely on the deep ball game? Because if that's their game again, I think we're going to end up having the same problem. Yeah, Dana, I mean, let me put it to you this way. How much do you think Eskridge can be part of what helps lift this offense? And how much do you think that Chris Carson or, you know, the running run attack is something that needs to, to be part of, of what lifts this offense? Um, I, I think a little bit of both. Um, I think that we have been, as far as I can tell, most people have been pretty pleased with what Alex Collins has done in Chris Carson's absence. I mean, he really has, you know, had the run game going and he's been hurt a little. So I'm a little concerned running backs and injuries. God love this team. But, um, you know, so it, it, I think that having Chris Carson back just adds another threat, which I think is really important. I think finding out what D has, and again, it was much like Daryl Taylor. We could hope, but we had no idea. Right. And so, um, bringing him back at least will put another, um, threat on the field um to maybe pull from dk and tyler a little bit but i don't know that we'll know for a couple games with him i think we're just gonna have to kind of watch and see how they use him um i do say this with with russell coming back you know before russell left he hasn't played since what week five was that when he got hurt um so he's had he had 10 touchdowns only one interception and a 125 rating which was number one in the nfl um and so i'm hoping that with seeing what gino did last week granted against Jacksonville, but then look what Jacksonville did to the Bills, you know, against Jacksonville, what they could do that they're going to trust that. Now, Pete said today in his press conference that he saw no limitations in Russell in any way, shape or form. And we've heard that from multiple people that he just looks like his normal self. And God knows we know he's in shape because he's out there pregame doing his runs and all the stuff that he does, which I love. I think that's awesome. But, um, and so I think that we don't have to worry about that. Um, It'll just be, the cold in green Bay this weekend and how that affects the hand, whether or not he wears a glove, like all that stuff could matter, but at least having one more option, be it Chris Carson or be it Eskridge, I I think can do nothing but good. Well, I think that that's a a good time to talk a little bit about OBJ um, because Mm -hmm. this was the other thing that was coming up and honestly is still an open question. So you guys might have later information, please. Both of you feel free to jump in if you have new info. But for folks that have been under a rock and haven't been paying attention to this, Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, worked his way out of Cleveland, uh, came to an agreement with them to be waived. And he was put on waivers this week. And he it would have cost a team to claim him $7.5 million for the rest of this season. So and there's like nine games left for the Seahawks. Is that right? So seven and a half million dollars for nine games. Um, by comparison, Greg Olson cost the Seahawks seven million dollars for sixteen games last year, um, which was obviously an awful, you know, contract. But in any event, a lot of money for a short amount of time, and nobody claimed him. Nobody was willing to do that. And and I think Jeff, you've talked about that 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 was the goal. Like Odell Beckham Jr. wanted to be able to choose where he played. That didn't mean teams didn't have the option to claim him. Um, let's. I want to come back and ask you a little bit about that, Jeff, and the dynamics of how that works with agents and teams, and how much teams really can just take somebody versus how much they kind of push them their weight around. Um, there was a lot of rumors about where his interest uh, was in playing. It was the Packers, but the Packers only have like the league minimum um to offer him due to their cap situation the saints which is where he is uh he he's i think he's from louisiana he obviously went to school at lsu 
Uh, that's been something that a lot of people have floated around. Uh, we've heard the Seahawks. We've heard the Chiefs. The Chiefs also seems like they don't have a lot to offer him um, and have not asked Patrick Mahomes to get involved in the recruitment process. And then I think as late as tonight, we've heard that Russell Wilson and Sean Payton are kind of at the front of the line in, in terms of trying to recruit uh, Odell Beckham Jr. And that it might be a few more days before he makes his decision. So anyone think he's going to play this weekend, let go of that. He's not going to play this weekend. But uh, let's start with this, Jeff. Um, talk about your understanding of how these situations work and what the power plays are at hand because Dana and Jeff, I want to talk a little bit. I think there's a lot of misperceptions out there about what the Seahawks had control to do, what they might not have, what it means, all those kinds of things. I want to spend a few minutes on that before we talk about the actual football stuff. Yeah. So to me, it was really telling last week when the rumors started to come out, he was about to get released because initially the word going around was, that Cleveland was going to structure its contract to be a minimum salary to help save them money on the whole thing because they were just cutting ties. The trade deadline had passed. So when this came out, this was set up that someone was going to claim it. If you had Odell for the minimum salary, someone was going to take a shot. But once the story came out of what really happened, what Beckham's camp did is they essentially wiped the last two years off his deal. Because he, I remember I talked about this in our chat the biggest reason he was going to go for the minimum salary was because there was no guaranteed money left in his last two years. So teams would have viewed it as just a pure rental at no cost. So he would have definitely been claimed. What his camp did is they came out and they wiped out those last two years and they forced all the remaining money in the last year was essentially signaled to the rest of the league that he's had $7.5 million and they know how these teams operate. These agents are talking to these teams all day. That whole contract was designed so that no one would claim him. They knew that no one would claim him based on the cap number, based on his value. He's a receiver who's not that productive this season. They knew no one would claim him. The whole thing was designed for him to get through waivers. In fact, he actually gave up money for essentially his freedom on the market. So everyone who was sitting here waiting for these claims, I kept just saying to everyone, no one's going to claim him. This is exactly what his camp essentially had set up and, they back channel. They know like Detroit's not going to put in a waiver claim for him. They know he's not going to be happy going there. So this was all very specifically designed. And I caught this pretty quickly, but Seahawks Twitter did not. So they were begging for a claim. And I just kept saying like, you guys are missing the story. So there was a lot of back channeling and all this, all these leaks that keep coming out. They're all very strategic. There's a reason they're all coming out. And then now that he's a free agent, you see what Green Bay is offering and you see what KC has left. From what I understand, there's just not a lot of big money going around in his direction. And I think he's a little taken back by it, which is why I think he's really he's taken a step back and delaying this process. So I think we have to understand the mechanics of how this works, where it's a lot easier for us to say, okay, they should claim him. And I, I get why I would have just as a unique situation for the Seahawks, but there is so much back channeling that goes on and there's a reason Josh Reynolds got released the day before the lions happened to cut their receiver. Like these teams know things. So there's a lot of back channeling. We're starting to see with Adam Schefter, how the sausage is made and some of the dirty stuff that goes on in that business. So again, the agents kind of control this whole industry and that's where all this Beckham stuff comes from. And that's where we have to understand just putting in a claim. It's not that simple. Yeah, I mean, Dana, I've seen it, and it's not it was not just DX Twitter. There was plenty of folks in in the media uh, that were, you know, local media that were saying like, Seahawks, you know, they they absolutely should put a claim in. They have the uh, the money. Uh, if they don't do it, or if it, you know, they've got to do the right thing by Russell by showing them that they're you know going to do this. For all we know, you know. Odell Beckham Jr.'s agents made it clear that any team that claimed him, he was not going to not gonna be happy, right? Like it was not going to be a good situation. There's a lot of those conversations and it may not have been as simple as just claim him. Um, so I was a little confused by the, like 32 teams did not claim OBJ, 32 teams. 
and there was a number of teams that had space. So I, I, I have a hard time seeing why the Seahawks are the villain in this situation or why they're like clueless somehow as a front office or, or gutless, you know, all these things that I'm kind of seeing out there about, about the situation. You know, it, and it's not just Seahawks Twitter. You know, I have a lot of uh, AFC West people on my on my timeline, and Chiefs fans were livid, absolutely livid. Restructure this, move this, move that. I'm like, you guys don't have a dime to your name. Like seriously, at this point, you can try and restructure stuff, but it, there was no point to it. He made it very clear he did not want to be picked up on waivers. He made that very clear. He wanted to be clear waivers so he could pick his team. And God knows what was said with that. I mean, we've seen players in the past who've come up and said, go ahead and pick me. I am not going to play for you. You know, flat out. I am not going to play with it for you. And so we don't know if that's what was being said or not. Um, but I think this, the money just didn't make sense, right? I think that, you know, to pay 7 million, it, it would just didn't make a lot of sense. Here's the interesting thing to me that, that I find about this whole Odell Beckham Jr. situation is that, I said this to you guys before we started, it's feeling a little like LeBron when he left Cleveland and ended up in Miami, except for he's not LeBron James. He's not that, you know, he's not going to get some big dollar amount. And you're talking mid-season money here, right? You're talking a, a half a year rental on most teams who've already spent their cap. For this year and so I'm not sure if he's expecting what, what he's expecting um, I, I think to be honest with you I would not be surprised still if Bill Belichick sweeps in and ends up getting him and I, I'm not kidding I really think that 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 bit makes sense but I will say this I was never high on the Odell Beckham thing but I'm not low on it either I just don't care and I think that that says something about him as a player he's injured every single season he hasn't had a really good season in years and years and yes, his quarterbacks. And I know that's what he's looking for. And he's not going to get it in New Orleans. So I'm not sure why that team was even in the talks. But I think that that this is just kind of a, huh, we'll see where he ends up. But I don't know that he'll make that big of an impact. I, I could be very wrong and eat my words, but I just don't feel it. Yeah. And, and there's another aspect of this that I think has come up as well. So so the, 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 the logic I've heard from folks that are saying, like, why didn't CX claim him? One, I almost none of them I hear them say Odell Beckham Jr. is like a diff, major difference maker. He's going to like make this team great. I don't hear anyone really making that case. What I hear is this team has been had a strained relationship with their quarter, their star quarterback. He has made it clear he wants to add big names and he wants to add receivers and they should do everything they can to placate him um, by adding folks to the team like OBJ. And they had the money. They had seven, they have 12 million in cap space. Spend the seven and a half million and add them to your team. Why wouldn't you do that? Like that's, that's kind of the logic I'm hearing, mm -hmm. which it, I think just before I even get like the cap space thing, I think it's a red herring. I don't think the Seahawks see themselves as having 12 million in cap space. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. I don't know how many people care about void contracts and all that stuff. But you get to keep what you don't spend. And I think they want to carry over cap room to next year um, to have more to spend there. Making a, a irresponsible contract decision or personnel decision to sign somebody who may not want to come to your team at a huge price point so that you may make your quarterback happy that is terrible, terrible front office decision-making. Anyone that would go through that is not a GM. Like I, I'm just super floored by that line of thinking because if they signed Odell Beckham and they claimed him and they paid him the money and the Seahawks didn't make the playoffs or they don't play well and it just doesn't go great, it's not going to do a damn thing to wh whether Russell's going to want to stay or not. Russell's kind of already got his mindset about whether he wants to stay or not. These are tiny, tiny little pebbles in what is a big ocean of a relationship between the Seahawks and, and the, the, and, and Wilson's camp. Do you guys agree or do you see it differently? You think that I'm being too uh, pedantic with this? I definitely agree with you. I, I think that's total fan fiction to think that, if they just sign Russell Odell Beckham, they can salvage the relationship. Yeah, you'd be throwing him a bone, no doubt. He clearly has a path of how he wants to play, who he wants to play with. And 
he's the one leading this recruiting pitch. But it's not like the Seahawks aren't making an effort. They're in the mix. They're going for it. Maybe they could have claimed them. Sure, that makes them happier in the short term. But like you said, we know what the root of the problem is with Russell. I think Russell's root of the problem is Pete Carroll's philosophy and how the Seahawks are team building. And Mm -hmm. you can take a side on that or not. We've all expressed that opinion a million times. But signing Odell Beckham does not change the root of the problem. Maybe yeah. they win a couple more games this year. Again, you empower him a little bit. That's great. But if, like you said, if he comes in and they get knocked out in the first round of the playoffs and he's at the Super Bowl again, watching Tom Brady, who knows how he feels? So, yeah, I saw you getting into it a couple people today, thinking this could salvage Russell's relationship. From what I understand, Russell's pretty happy with their pursuit of Beckham. Um, that's what I've heard. And there's seven teams in the mix. It's not like the Seahawks could just magically. We don't know if money, if he goes to Green Bay, clearly money doesn't matter to him in this case. So other than them claiming him, which was a situation, you could totally understand why every team in the league passed on it. So I think it's it's completely nonsensical to say this one move could salvage this relationship unless they ended up winning the Super Bowl as a result, which I think all of us would say that's probably pretty unlikely. So Dana... Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm guessing you agree. So I, let's turn the conversation a little bit to he still might sign here. Like that, that is, I think, a realistic chance. You, you know, because I've been in chat for a while that I thought the Patriots were a very logical landing spot for him. And so I agree with you that he, he could end up there. He could end up in a number of places. Let's say for a second he does come to Seattle. What, how do you feel about that? Because what that would mean – most likely D. Eskridge, assuming D. Eskridge stays healthy, which is a big if, mm-hmm. is not going to get nearly the number of snaps or targets or, or opportunities. It also may mean that there's fewer targets for DK or Tyler. It, it may mean that the offense plays better, like for mm-hmm. some of the reasons we've talked about. So how do you feel like if OBJ tomorrow, we find out that OBJ is going to sign, how do you think it affects the team? Well, my personal feeling is that I, I'd be like, oh, okay. Like, seriously, because it's not costing us draft picks. It's not costing us a lot of money is what my hope would be. Um, and I completely do agree with you and Jeff. I, I don't think this, I think Russell Wilson wants him there. I know they're friends and you always want to play with your friends. And he probably thinks he can add something and that's great. But how do they use him? And I, I put this on Twitter today in a reply to someone. I said, you know, why would he want to come here and be a third wide receiver And I got answers from like, oh, he wants the money. Well, no, this isn't about money, obviously. You know, or he would have said the first team picked me up for 7 million. Like, I don't care, I'll go play for the Lions. You know what I mean? So I don't think that that's it. But I think that if he were to come in, I think the impact, I don't know that it would be noticeable right away, maybe eventually, but it does worry me about the development of DS group. I mean, they took him really high and if they want him to develop and become, you know, a DK level, which would be hard because DK is so fantastic, but DK level or Tyler Lockett level wide receiver, if they really truly think he's healthy. And I think that's the question really. It's like, yes. Oh, we're not going to hold him back in practice, but is he really healthy from his concussion? If they really truly think he's healthy, I don't know how hard they will pursue this. Um, I've seen people compare this to Percy Harvin. I've seen them compare it to all kinds of stuff. But if they're not 100% sure about D, or if they're not liking what they're seeing, then I can see that they the, the reason behind it. But to be honest with you, I don't know that he would have a huge impact. And he's already been injured this season. So how do we know he even stays on the field? Like, I just don't trust it. Yeah, Jeff, where are you on this? Like, just pure football impact of adding OBJ to the Seahawks. Um, Normally, I would be pretty against a move like this. Um, Just, I've seen a lot in Cleveland where you've seen just the performance without him better and the addition by subtraction. But the Seahawks are three and five. And all indications are their best case scenario is a wild card, worst case scenario. They end up in the same situation they're in now. So to me, there was nothing to lose. So I, I embraced it. I, it would obviously be exciting to have a, a three-headed receiver group like that. It would obviously open up things for the other receivers. And f- just for pure entertainment value, I thought there was a lot of reason to be excited there. But I'm sorry with Dana. Like, I wouldn't blink an eye either way. In terms of D. Eskridge, I actually think from the Seahawks' perspective, it would have made a lot of sense to sort of hedge him 
and ease him into it because he's coming off a major concussion. So you never know how someone will respond if they're their next hit to the head. And it would be a great situation because he's a rental player. Then you sort of hedge him and you can build him up for next year. And if he's ready to play, then great. You got four receivers. But at the end of the day, like if you're I'm truly analyzing the Seahawks, there's not a lot of games this year where I'm like, you know, if they had one better receiver, they might have won this game or they might have won this game. To me, I see a lot of other areas where that were where I would be like, if they could add like a quality offensive lineman or a, a game wrecking defensive lineman or a coverage player, to me, that would get me excited. A third receiver is a pure luxury. But, like, you can win the Super Bowl. The Seahawks receivers, when they won the Super Bowl, were a lot different than these, this group. You want to build up the core of your team. And, like, you see a lot of teams around the league, they have all these receivers. But if you can't block up front like the Rams the other night, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So I'd rather build up the core of this team. That would excite me a lot more. But, yeah, I'd be all in if they signed Beckham. There's nothing to lose, in my opinion. There's yeah. nothing uh, to lose. Sorry, finish your thought. No, you? so it's – but if they don't get them, I won't even blink an eye. Yeah, I think we're all in violent agreement here. Um, <laughs> we'll definitely do an emergency pod if he signs. Oh, boring. <laughs> it's, it's worth talking about, and I think it would be fun to have him. And uh, I do – look, you guys know I've been banging the drum on a veteran wide receiver, third wide receiver on this team since the middle of the offseason, like before the draft, like – I think that the the construction of the the wide receiver group was really flimsy and all it needed was one injury to D Eskridge to have you really hurting there. And Freddie Swain, like he's just not rising to be anything more than a fourth receiver. That looks like what he is. So um, if I knew that D Eskridge was going to be healthy, like, and, and, and able and available the rest of the year, my gut is actually that he will would help the team more um, than than OBJ. That sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy. We don't know much, but that's just my gut instinct based on what I've seen of DS Gridge and frankly what I've seen from OBJ for the last couple of years. But OBJ is a more sure bet. Even the, even seventy five or sixty percent of OBJ is light years better than what we've been getting at the third receiver position. And I do think it would affect coverages because the NFL is stupid. They don't pay attention as much to how players are playing lately. <laughs> They're like, he's OBJ. We're going to dedicate a safety to him. And it's like, okay, like the guy has like no working shoulders, but okay, go for it. So in any event, um, I, 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 I think both would be, it'd, it'd be great to have both. Um, and if he goes somewhere else, fine. And that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, and I certainly, I, I do not look at this as a situation, man, the Seahawks blew it. I think the Seahawks are trying to sign him. They're trying to do it the same way they, they signed Josh Gordon, the same way they signed Greg Olson, the same way they tried to sign Antonio Brown. They've tried to sign pretty much every guy that Russell said he wanted. <clears throat> not all of them want to come here. <clears throat> That's just a fact. So uh, anyway, Let's take a few patron questions, if you guys are up for that, before we talk about this Packers game. I want to make sure we get some time to talk about the Packers game. I think this is a really cool game for a lot of reasons. Um, <clears throat> but uh, before we do that, give the show a like, please. Quick thumbs up. Uh, takes a second. Uh, click subscribe if you're new to the show. Welcome. Great to have you. Just click subscribe. Click the bell to get notified when we go live, because we, we're generally every Wednesday night, uh, and then post game. But there's news that breaks. So we, we come out at different times. Um, and then patreon.com slash hawkblogger. Sign up, get immediate access to our Slack channel where you get to ask patron questions. You get to talk with the rest of the community. It's a really cool group, good people, um, really chill and, and talk Seahawks all the time. Uh, increasingly talking also Mariners. And some people I think are starting to talk Kraken. I will not be part of the Kraken conversations. Um, but I'm happy that people are. So uh Dana, let's give you the first question. This comes from Jason A. Let's, I'm reading these without actually previewing them. So let's hope they're well thought out. <laughs> let's play a game. Predict OBJ's performance on Sunday with his new team. Assume that it's not Sunday. Okay. Okay. For double points, predict which team he plays for. Wait, what's the prize? How many points are in a game for a prize? <laughs> I know it's not clear. Uh, 
And, and then also, if you want a secondary question here, what finger related products and brands should be chasing Russ as a rep with his triumphant return? <laughs> No, no. I think Russ's face is on enough things right now. I don't know that he needs anything else. So when Odell ends up with a team, I think it's really just going to depend on who who the quarterback is. I mean, if he ends up with the Saints, he's probably not going to have a huge impact right away, maybe a touchdown, um, that sort of thing. He ends up with Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson or even Mac Jones, because I'm so impressed with that rookie. Um, You know, his impact could be a little bit better. So if I have to predict, I would say six catches for 70 yards and maybe a touchdown okay which team did you say you predict he plays for um you can stick with what you said earlier i i i have a i I think that i wouldn't be surprised we end up in new england i have a weird suspicion he's gonna end up in seattle i don't know why i just do um i don't think he ends up with the packers i would be real surprised if he ends with the saints um just because from what has been said about what he's looking for um and the packers just flat out and the chiefs can't afford it i just don't know how they could afford it well, the Chiefs seem to have a money tree. They just go out and hit up every once in a while and just get yeah. a little bit more cash out of it. But um, yeah, I, I, I have a weird feeling he's going to end up in Seattle, but New England, I think, is a dark horse for sure. Okay, good answer. Jeff, uh, this comes from DJ Burnett. Uh, if our offense scores more than 13 points against the Packers, how confident will you be in this offense moving forward? For reference, the Chiefs only scored 13 points when they have been considered a top three offense in the NFL. This year. Yeah, if you've watched the Chiefs play lately, they've looked bad for a long period of time. And I know all these people come out and say they've been unlucky. And just watching them, they don't look right. I don't want to dive too much into the Chiefs, but they're not a very good offense right now. And frankly, their passing game has looked a little off. Travis Kelsey's looked a little different. And so if the Seahawks score like 17 points or 14 points, I would not be very excited about that. So I would not use last game as a measuring stick at all. Um, I think the Seahawks, we need to hold them to the standard we were talking about early in the year. We need them to be a top offense to them to have a chance and build up any hope in the second half. Because if they come out, they put up 14 points. I think a lot of us will just revert back to our opinion of this team a couple of weeks ago, where we really, some of us didn't even care to watch some of the games. So I would not use that 14 point as any sort of measuring stick. That Kansas City team is not what it, So let me let me reframe the question then. What yeah. would what would you consider the minimum bar for a good offensive uh performance against the the Packers? In terms of total points? Mhm. I'd say over 24 points. Hmm. Yeah, I mean to me I think over 20. Like, I think I have a lot of respect for the way the Packers defense has been playing, but um, yeah, yeah, 24 for sure. Um, Okay, let's take another one here. Uh, I'll take this one. Um, This comes from Braxton. DJ Reed has played pretty solid for most of the season since moving back to the other corner spot. What do you think an extension would look like, and should the Hawks be the ones to give it to him? Uh... That's actually a really tough question. Um, do we know if DJ Reed is this is the last year of his deal? I thought he was, he's not a, a restricted free agent. Let me quickly check. I believe he's unrestricted. Wow, because he's still like he was picked up. Yeah, he is UFA. Yeah, this is uh, UFA next year. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's playing himself into a pretty hefty contract. I mean, he's been. I don't know that he will get the money that Shaquille Griffin got, but he's in my mind has been a better corner than Shaquille Griffin has been uh, this season when he's been playing in his natural position. Does not mean he's great. Doesn't mean he's a pro bowler, but he is, I think a solidly above average cornerback um, in the NFL starting cornerback. So uh, should the Seahawks be the ones to, to give him an extension? I'm thinking about the Seahawks DB room and thinking, yeah, I think they probably should. I think there's not a a limitless amount of money I would uh, apply to DJ Reed. I don't think he's that kind of player, but if you can get him for a reasonable contract, I don't know what, 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 
do we know what the like the the going rate is for for the top 10 corners i can kind of pull it up yeah let me pull it up for a second i mean i'm thinking like seven to eight million a year is that crazy for for a starting cornerback is that super low no there's some stuff like patrick peterson signed for eight million last year yeah i mean that's i would i would spend that kind of money on dj reed i i think he's i like him as a comp- yeah, it should be a Wuzie signed for seven point two million as a free agent this year. Yeah, if he starts getting higher, if you're starting all of a sudden, he gets a, a market where he's ten million or something like that. I think I go back to the draft and and go back to other spots. Um, but it's tough. I mean, if you can lock down a corner and have them be a, a decent corner, um, the Seahawks certainly need that. So uh, I would be in favor of it with certain limits uh all right dana uh (laughs) oh uh this is from danny mccormick says guys i benched 225 this week for the first time so first of all congratulations danny my question is can evan even bench 80 pounds or is he too busy waiting for pete carroll fired tweets (laughs) i i have no idea what Evan benches and have no idea or any plans to find out. Um, I, I do, I do think that we have missed Evan the last couple of weeks and, and he has not been able to be here, but I will say this. I think his vitriol for Pete Carroll just comes from a need and a want of change. And, and so I, I don't think this year is going to change that in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> but for what he benches, you know, I don't know. You could probably just bench Evan and, that that would be it yeah yeah i love that uh jeff okay we'll take a couple more uh kanishk asks uh how likely will the seattle defense fold an aaron Rodgers offense when he would have only practiced uh one day in the last two weeks this is to me the most fascinating story of the game we've seen guys how covid has impacted people's bodies in general and you saw with like someone like cam newton last year where took like six seven weeks to get figured out and so uh, to me it's it's almost impossible to predict how someone's going to respond to this and especially Aaron Rodgers who I don't know how much practice time he needs he knows this offense it's offense designed for him but I, I'm not happy that he's going to come back and he's going to be a little pissed off also all this, the narrative about him he's probably going to be a little annoyed all week and he's going to want to have a good game but yeah I think there's potential there and if they there are circ- a number of circumstances in their favor. He's not practicing. He's kind of, he, his body might be physically worn down. We don't even know if he's going to play. He even admitted the other day that there's a small chance he doesn't play. So one thing I read, and we'll talk about this, they played offense a little differently than what you might be familiar with. Even last year where they were like clicking on all cylinders. They've been really conservative on offense. They've been really leaning on their running backs. And really they've been more run early and throw on third down uh, thing we're very familiar with in Seattle so Aaron's a little better than Russell on third down is so they're pretty dangerous at that but it's not the team you were seeing last year just throw the ball over the yard I'm I have Aaron Rodgers in one of my fantasy leagues and he doesn't have a lot of big statistical games and it's just a very ball control they haven't had their offensive line healthy all year so they've had to play a little different so I don't think it's going to be one of these games where they just like Rogers tears them apart for 400 yards and four touchdowns. I think they're going to be pretty conservative and they're going to go through Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams as much as they can. And AJ Dillon's pretty good, but it's not going to look like it did where we were just dreading the, like the Matt Stafford game where he was just tossing the ball over the yard in the second half. Yeah, we'll talk. I'm eager to talk about the Packers game in more detail. We'll do that in a second. A um, couple more questions here. Uh, Robin Solari, I'll take this one, asks, uh, are we pumped for the D. Eskridge comeback? Um, if he plays, do you think he gets enough action to make a difference in the game? And do you think his presence changes Waldron's scheme back to more like what we saw in the Colts game? I think that's one of the more fascinating pieces. Uh, whether or not they have a, assigned that kind of importance to D. Eskridge individually or whether that part of the offense has just been missing for whatever reason. Like I thought Penny Hart would be used more in jet sweeps 
with Eskridge out. And we've seen like one, maybe two in, in all the weeks um, since. And so maybe one of the benefits of having D Eskridge is he will be a reliable third receiver. So he'll be on the field, whether they're running a jet sweep or not. The challenge with a Penny Hart situation is like, if he's in there, teams are gonna be like, oh, jet sweep, right? Like it becomes a little more obvious what package he's part of a little bit more misdirection and a little bit more element of surprise with D Eskridge. He's going to be there more often. Look, I'm pretty bullish on D Eskridge. Uh, you know, I, I think people get it twisted because I was so down on the draft pick because I wanted them to take Creed Humphrey and still think that would have been the right move to make for a bunch of reasons. But I really like what I've seen from D Eskridge. And I think my gut is if he can actually stay on the field, I think he can be a difference maker. Like I really do. I, I think he can, I think he's the type of guy that's going to be a better receiver than people realize. I think he's going to get separation and get open. And I think he's going to get run after the catch. And I think he's going to be a part of that jet sweep, like running game. I don't think it's unrealistic to think that this could be a guy that has a few games where he has three or four catches for, you know, 80, 90 yards um, and some long touchdowns. Like I think he can be that kind of player. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see him. I really am. I'm hoping he's unrestricted and 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 how he's allowed to play. But mainly, I just hope he stays healthy uh, for his sake and for everyone who wants to watch him play. Um, all right, Dana, I'm going to give you this last one. Uh, this is from Andy Pate. Honest predictions, expectations for Russell Wilson's performance this week in Lambeau. Hard to believe that he won't be at least a little rusty, which still puts him puts the team in a better spot over Gino, obviously. So what are your yeah. prediction expectations for us this week? You know, I think that we're going to see the Russell Wilson we're used to, but maybe just slightly limited. Maybe, although he was throwing bombs, you know, at, you know, in the long ball at practice, that's with no one really coming at him. The, the bigger factor I think it's going to be in this Green Bay game is going to be the weather and the temperature and those cold temperatures on that hand. You know, anyone who's ever had, a tendon injury or even a broken bone knows that when it's cold, it aches just a little bit more. And so they asked Pete Carroll today, you know, is he going to wear a glove? Is he doing, you know, what's his plan? And he said that he been trying out all kinds of things. So I think that he expects that too, but I think that we will be a so relieved to have Russell Wilson back under center that we're just going to be thrilled at what he can do. And the fact that he came back so fast, because remember when this happened, we're like, well, he's going to try to come back for green Bay, but I don't think that's going to happen. And, and look, he did it. Um, but I won't be surprised if he's not, it, it's not going to be the best game of his career. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about this Packers game, this <laughs> Seahawks Packers game. I mean, I spent a lot of time writing and looking into it this morning. So I'll, I'll kind of give you guys the floor to start with, but uh, you know, Jeff, as you were kind of talking about earlier, the Packers offense is not great. Uh, has not been, you know, they have some obviously star talent. Devonte Adams is fantastic. And obviously Aaron Rodgers is an MVP and um, they might be getting David Bakhtiari back this week, their left tackle. Uh, although it's not for sure that he's going to play. Uh, and then they've got those two running backs that have been really solid. But they're like 20th in the NFL in scoring. They're 22nd in the NFL in yards per game. They're 18th in the NFL in third down. They're 19th in the NFL in yards per play. Uh, 22nd in pass yards. I mean, this is not the offense that I think a lot of people have come to expect from the Packers. No, and if you've watched a lot of their games, they've been kind of a slog and like they've been ugly football. There was that game in Cincinnati where there was like seven missed kicks and they struggled with the Lions in half. And the biggest thing that's been different for them, if you remember the Packers last year, they were a dominant pass protecting offensive line. Corey Lindsley left in free agency. That was a guy that Seahawks fans and especially all of us became very familiar with. He was our number one free agent target. They drafted a rookie right after the Eskridge pick Josh Myers, who's injured, and he was playing okay, but they're on a backup center, and David Bakhtiari has been playing left tackle all year, which has shifted one of their best offensive linemen, Elgin Jenkins, over to left tackle, so it's made almost two positions weaker. So I think, of, to Matt LaFleur's credit, they saw early in the year in that Saints game especially that they just couldn't hold up on the offensive line without their personnel, and they had to adjust their offense to a very different 
look, they're playing much safer. They're scheming high percentage stuff, but not a lot of big chunk plays. And like, they don't really, have, again, we, we know this from Washington, they don't have a lot of weapons in the passing game outside of Devontae Adams. So their offense is a lot more easy throws, low percentage throws. There's not a lot of deep shots. And it's why their offense is not scoring the numbers they did last year. So they've had trouble in pass protection all year long. They have not held up. Back to Yari coming back, that could really change things. But again, they don't have that center there. So offensively, they're different than what we're used to. And that's what made them so good last year. Rodgers with that pass protection, it was a dominant force. And now when he's kind of running for his life, it looks a little different. Are, are you guys ready for the Seahawks defense to hold the Packers offense and for everyone to say, or for people to be like, oh, yeah, well, well Rodgers was out sick. It doesn't really oh, care. 100%. I, if that happens, I mean, I will say, no matter what the lead up is for this, I mean, my general expectation is Aaron Rodgers is going to play. We all expected it from the moment it was announced. He doesn't need practice. It's not going to be a big deal. He'll have – and that Aaron Rodgers is going to play really well and everyone will celebrate like, oh my God, what an amazing like performance with, you know, one day of rest. So if the opposite happens, if the Seahawks actually like play solid defense and make his life miserable, screw anybody that's like diminishing that performance. It is not easy to go into Lambeau. It is not easy to play Aaron Rodgers at any point or Devontae Adams, or the rest of that offense, even with these numbers we're talking about. So my my expectation, I'm my, like, I guess my take on this is if, if the Seahawks hold the Packers under 20 points, that would be a fantastic performance by this defense. All things aside, is, is, is what's your number, Dana? Like, what, what do you think is, would be a good performance for the Seahawks defense? So I'm looking at the games they played this year. And if you ignore the Saints game, which is the first game of the year, you know, they've beaten really bad teams by a lot, but somewhat good teams, they don't. They squeak out the wins, right? They only beat the 49ers, who are a questionable team, by two. Um, they beat the Bengals in overtime by three. Um, they beat the Cardinals by three. You know, they, they're squeaking out these wins, but They are managing to score 24 points, 24 points, 24 points, 24 points in three games in a row, right? So I think, and then some of these other ones, they 25 points, 27, only a couple of times that they managed to get into the 30s. So here's, here's what it is for me. I think that if they can manage to keep the same, uh, excuse me, the Packers under that 24 point mark, they have a very good chance of winning. Because I don't know that we're going to see a lot of explosion out of Russell. I could be really wrong on that to keep up with that. So if that defense can slide in and keep them under that 24, 25 point mark, first of all, it's going to be fantastic for this defense because that's hasn't been done by anybody. And other than the chiefs, obviously without Aaron Rodgers. Um, and, and then I think that, that the Seahawks have a very good chance of getting to that number, even with Russell Wilson possibly being hampered. I think that this game is um, going to rely. Now, the thing of it is though, you guys, Green Bay's pass defense is good, right? Like they're really good. And so that could be a huge problem. I don't know what they were, how their run defense is going because that one stat just came to me. Um, But it was just, um, I, I think that if the defense can just keep that game to under that 24 or right around that 24 mark that Seattle could, they could actually do this with or without Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the Packers pass defense and Jeff or Dana, I don't know if you have any updates, but like, um, so Jairi Alexander, I believe is still out um, and it's not expected mm-hmm. back in this game. He's their best cornerback. Mm-hmm. Eric Stokes went down in the Chiefs game is another cornerback. I have not been able to find anything updates about whether he's practicing or I or do anything. not believe he practiced today. I believe he did not. So they could be down a few corners um, at that spot. And the Seahawks are getting healthier at receiver. And the Seahawks, what we haven't talked about is the Seahawks are coming off a bye week. And they've had multiple weeks to prepare for this Packers team. And I, and the other injury that's worth watching is Kenny Clark. 
he's a really good defensive tackle, Jeff, and a disruptive defensive tackle. And he had to leave the Chiefs game as well. He's not able to play. This is already a Packers defense where they've been great at just about everything except for red zone defense. They're 31st in the NFL and rushing. Um, They're 26th in the NFL in yards per rush. And if they're going to be missing Kenny Clark and you've got Russ coming back after an injury, I'm not saying just forget passing and don't do that, but is there part of you that would say, Hey, maybe this is a, a game where you do want to try to get the run going and do want to have Alex Collins. Oh, sorry. Good Dana. Go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. See, I try to be so good. Not interrupt you guys. So sorry. So Eric Stokes was limited today. So he did do something as was Kenny Clark was limited today. So I just want to make sure people knew that. Sorry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, Jeff, do you, do you, what, what is your game plan on offense here? How do you attack the the Packers defense knowing what you know? So it's a tricky thing because yeah, in theory, having the run game would be really valuable, but you also have, we, I'm not sure how healthy Alex Collins is. He looked certainly slowed the last couple of weeks with that groin injury. Chris Carson, I don't know if he's going to play. He's coming off the neck injury. So yeah, that might be a way to attack them, but we haven't just seen the offensive line other than that one quarter in Pittsburgh look like a group that's really capable of being a good run blocking line. And frankly, Ethan Posick has been at, it's been probably the starting center for the rest of the year. That's certainly a weakness of his. He is not good physically holding up the point of attack. So while schematically they might be a little weaker, I, I think Seattle's going to have to play through their strengths in this game. And I know that also fits into green Bay strength. They're a lot better in the back seven. But I think for Seattle's offense to work, they're going to need it to go through Tyler and DK again. And hopefully they can use D to sort of operate as a short-term running game because I just haven't seen a lot of evidence, again, outside of that one quarter in Pittsburgh that the Seahawks are a functional running team. They haven't looked good holding the line of scrimmage and they haven't looked good running the football. And Chris Carson really hasn't looked like himself all year other than that first game of the season. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I My feeling is, I think it'd be a lot to ask Russ to carry the team in this first game back in this weather, you know, in Lambeau. I'm sure he would not agree and would want to take every snap and, and you know, throw every ball. But I do think the running game is going to be important in this one. Uh, you know, whether or not it's been effective or not, I think this is a team that's been a little vulnerable against the run. And I think the Seahawks will have a much better chance to win if they can sustain some drives, get some first downs and not have to rely on Russell passing every time. Um, so, and ideally keeping the ball out of Rogers hands a little bit more. Um, as we talked about the Seahawks have not been good at that so far this year. Um, can I just say, I'm not as convinced as you guys are that Rogers is going to play. I don't know if you guys watched the, this last Tuesday's Pat McAfee interview with him. Um, But he said a couple of things that, and granted, now we know that he lies. And so we don't know that it's necessarily true. But he said that he was finally on the other side of COVID, which to me gives me the impression. Because on Friday, he kept saying how much that he was really sick Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And that Friday, he felt really good. But then yesterday, he said that it 